डियर फेसबुक प्योर यूरोलॉजी व्यूअर्स एज यू ऑल नो देर आर सर्टन टॉपिक्स इन यूरोलॉजी विच आर प्राइमरीली डिफिकल्ट एज सर्जिकल टेक्निक पॉइंट ऑफ व्यू बिकॉज दे आर नॉट ईजीली अप्रोचेबल द एरिया विच यू वॉन्ट टू ऑपरेट इज अ क्रिटिकल एरिया दी आई फील रेडिकल प्रोस्टरेक्टमी अनास्टमोसिस बिफोर दी डाविन्सी हेज कम एंड ईवन आफ्टर दी डाविन्सी हेज कम एरिया अराउंड दि बिलो दि रीनल हईलम अंड अप टू दि बैफर्केशन आफ दि अयोटा एरिया वाट एवर सेड एंड डन इज अ क्रिटिकल एरिया सो नाट आल दि सर्जन अटेम्प्ट नाट आल दि सर्जन हेव एक्सपीरियंस टू बी हानेस्ट I have not done single case of retroperitoneal uh, the uh, lymphadenectomy in that region. Uh, for various reasons, I am in private practice. So similarly, even with a, a good amount of private practice, uh, we could not get such cases, and it is difficult to uh, do more so after chemotherapy. So today, I uh, I am very happy uh, to meet. Uh, our uh, speaker i will introduce the speaker through the uh, um, uh, pure forum i am very happy that i got introduced professor and dr khalid uh, sir from the pure group he was also a member of the alto and robotic forum group regularly he was interacting about radical prostatectomy and other laparoscopic surgeries then i came to know that he is definitely a laparoscopic surgeon and slowly last 3 months i came to understand that he is a uh, level of interaction at a higher level either comment suggestion or uh, feedback so then i approached uh, dr kalit sir through messenger and he immediately accepted his willingness uh, to speak on his area of interest so to introduce uh, primarily today only i came to know brief uh, about sir he did mbbs and frcs urology which is one of the highest respected degree in the world so presently is consultant urology and laparoscopic surgeon at jordan hospital in amman jordan fellow of royal college of surgeons in urology frcs england fellow of urology board in urology certificate of completion of surgical training in urology ccst rci american fellowship in urology oncology boston he is interested in uro oncology german fellowship in advanced laparoscopic surgery heidelberg university irish fellowship in kidney transplantation beaumont hospital dublin irish fellowship in robotic surgery master um, mater hospital dublin former consultant laparoscopic surgeon and associate professor at king hussein cancer center former consultant urologist and laparoscopic surgeon at mercy university hospital ireland He is a pioneer in introducing advanced laparoscopy and minimal invasive urological oncological surgery in ireland jordan and iraq too primarily he belongs to iraq by native nativity He has published in American Journal of Urology, British Journal of Surgery, Journal of Endourology, and Arab Journal of Urology. Many original articles, uh, papers about urology, oncology, laparoscopic surgery, and kidney transplantation. He has active participation and scientific presentation at national and international meetings. Main interest is minimally invasive urological oncology. Sir, I wanted to ask you a few questions pertaining to your career. Uh, primarily when you did in your mbbs first of all good afternoon uh, from all the uh, urologists predominantly india and rest of the world uh, happy to interact uh, a senior who is introduced through the uh, uh, facebook and then i am interviewing as well as listening to your talk thank you very much sir good afternoon shandra mohan thank you very much for yes. giving opportunity to meet yourself first of all face to face and also to meet uh, our colleagues and uh, I'm aware about really great great surgeons from India I met them 
in the UK and in Ireland and also in uh, states as well. And in addition to the great surgeon who are still operating in India as well. So good afternoon for everybody. Good afternoon. So uh, the uh, after your MBBS, what made you uh, to show interest in urology primarily? How you uh, got interest? It's already, honestly, uh, it's one of my senior resident uh, who is now a consultant, a well-known consultant urologist in UK. Uh, I was a very junior doctor and uh, he was preparing for his FRCS exam, part one, which was the uh, plan in Baghdad. Baghdad was the first center in the Middle East. Yeah. Uh, held the FRCS part one exam in the Middle East. So he was preparing for his exam and he wants some energetic young uh, resident to put the load uh, at his shoulder. And I was so admired by his way of doing the procedure, the urethral dilatation in the side room, in the floor, and also how he approach his patient, how he does the urodynamic studies. And the passion started from that time. Which that year, was, sir? Which year it is? <laughs> that was in 1986. Oh, fantastic. Great. <laughs> so uh, uh, after that, uh, you moved to UK for education? Uh, no, I, first of all, when I finished my uh, bachelor degree in Iraq, then I joined uh, the postgraduate training in Iraq. Okay. I finished four years of postgraduate training in urology. I okay. think it's just like the DMP in, uh, in India. Yeah. And, uh, at that time, after I finished, the country was uh, not doing well at many aspects. Yeah. And that, at that stage, I decided to leave First of all, I came to Jordan. I worked around three, four years in Jordan. And yeah. I did another training in Jordan. I did their local training, higher training in urology. And then we moved to the uh, to Ireland with my wife. She's a doctor as well. And okay. during that time, also, I finished my training in Ireland. And also, I did my fellowship in the States and in Germany as well. Uh, very few people will be uh, uh, concentrating on kidney transplantation. I'm surprised that uh, you are balancing both, which is also my interest and my hospital has permission. We do kidney transplantation. Uh, are you still doing and very well acquainted with all the recipient and the donor? Sure. Unfortunately, now I'm not involved in kidney transplant service. Okay, okay. Uh, but you have done? Oh, I have done a lot really because not. Ireland. Your, uh, your CV yeah. speaks that. Yeah, because my my center in Ireland, which I was working there, was the highest or the largest volume of kidney transplant in UK and Ireland. Both. Yeah. We were doing around 120 to 130 deceased kidney transplant per year. And also we were doing around 30 living related. In addition to the pancreas transplant as well. We are, the, kidney, the pancreas transplant was do, was was part of the urology because our boss was doing both. Ah, oh, 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 nice. And we do the SKP, the simultaneous kidney pancreas transplant as well. So I have the chance really to get exposed to the kidney transfer to the pancreas transplant as well. But unfortunately, nowadays I'm mainly devoted for the oncology work. So last question before I hand over the program. Uh, all these surgeons who are in 90s might have done open surgery with beautiful skills, square knot, left hand thumb, right hand thumb, cross, all that. Then a little bit of endourology like TURP, then URSL, or PCNL. And then back to robotic surgery with partial nephrectomy, radical prostatectomy. Then again the machine with your around 30 years of career, uh, what do you think the young urologists, should they be knowing good open surgical principles? Are they in the worldwide adequately trained? I, I got reasonably good training in All India Institute of Medical Sciences, one of the prestigious institute for MS. After that, not much. So, what is your opinion about the current surgical technique training? Let it be any surgery, dissection of the tissue, uh, 
we see with eyes in open surgery we learn better and in robot you don't have that feel you see and then decide do you think that after pump passing mbbs the surgeons will be able to tackle open surgery in the future generations as you have done it uh no fortunately for me i went through the all phases yeah that's the, why i'm asking yeah because i was lucky really to work with giant surgeon in iraq jordan and even in ireland in the open surgery and then i found my path through the embryology laparoscopy and robotic but when i went to germany to have my laparoscopic training and we had at that time an excellent what they call them the operats in germany they do fantastic laparoscopic prostatectomy yeah german does but if anything happen and they have to convert to open they really just stand still in front of the field they don't know where to go and then we come here the rescue people and come and completed by open technique so it was surprising really how this is skills in robotic surgery or in open surgery uh can lead to this deficient open uh orientation first of all and i remember uh, uh one of the italian famous italian robotic surgeon he published uh, a photo on his uh, uh twitter account and he said that a very busy resident come to see my open surgery while they left the robotic surgery so we don't know probably now we back again people looking yeah, yeah, yeah. so this, this is an important I, I would say all of them they are needed really and it's very good to have one expert open surgeon in the department even if the service is a pure robotic or laparoscopic surgeon so definitely the duration is quite unlucky to go through the extensive open work yeah. there are certain students who have never seen laparotomy and can do any surgery laparoscopically true no younger generation i am telling never seen a laparotomy very true you want to very cut true. the rib you should know what is periosteal elevation and exactly. then what is the uh, uh, rib cutting instruments and all anyway exactly. with that uh, why i am asking these questions relevant today when you are doing in the retroperitoneum around the aorta any bleeder you have to quickly act open you know 5060 open uh, suturing uh, applying open clamps and taking the pressure at that time it's matter of minutes that something can wrong happen while dissecting anything can happen anyway uh, let's hope the younger generation can handle that too by seeing the videos or by learning as you said one open surgeon for example if i have been if i have been asked to do open prostatectomy probably i may not do as well uh the seniors have done it easily i have i have not done i have not done my open prostatectomy much i'm sorry to say sir i over to you for the program uh, please present your talk sir thank you very much So thank you again for giving me this opportunity. Uh, so I think everybody pay great respect to this quotation from William Osler, who is the father of the new medicine, and his this quotation is one hundred and fifty year old. Diseases that harm need treatment that harm less. If we have a good application for this statement, is the testicular cancer? Why? Because if we look to the patient of of the testicular cancer, they are young. Most of them, at the time of the diagnosis of the treatment, they are not married or not father any child. And the third good thing is that their disease. even if it is metastatic it carries a very high chance of a cure so they live long to see the side effects of the disease and the treatment of the disease and if we look what happened in the testicular cancer in the last decade in order to 
reduce this morbidity associated with the treatment of cancer. We will see that the production of the non-risk adapted surveillance for a clinical stage one seminoma and non-seminoma after, first of all, was adapted for only high risk. Nowadays, it is adapted for both. And I think the Canadian by Dr. A.S. Jewett from Princess Margaret, who really championed this uh, concept. And again, if we see in the, if you look in the AU guidelines, since 2015, radiotherapy is not recommended for stage one seminoma, while it was a routine for every patient. And again, we can see the introduction of single agent chemo for a clinical stage one seminoma, and also the single course chemo for a clinical stage high risk non seminoma uh, instead of the classic uh, two cycles. So, once again, if we look uh, to the introduction of more surgery to the testicular cancer with the new concept of nerve sparing we will see the uh, success rate of more than 65 percent of the patient for a clinical stage 2a or tb when they have a small volume around five centimeter metastasis in the retroperitoneum for non-seminoma and even nowadays there is a growing evidence that probably for a clinical stage 2A and B seminoma, nerve sparing retroperitoneal plant dissection may represent an individual, but still very high cure rate uh, uh, procedure. And again, if we look, because we adapt more patient for surveillance, we start to have the, what we call it, the late recurrence. And if you look to the, this group uh, of patient with the late recurrence on surveillance, we will find that 70% of their relapse is purely in the retroperitoneal. However, majority of patients, more than 80%, treated routinely by chemotherapy. While if we do surgery for them, it can be cured alone in more than 60% of the patient. Mm -hmm. So if we look really to the main concept, which, has, which I do believe in it much, that the only constant things in life is change. And for this reason, and for this young generation, we should change our strategies because we start uh, having learning a lot of lesson about the side effects of their treatment. So if we come to the retroperitoneal post chemo, retroperitoneal if not dissection, is a still a topic of a great debate. Historically, every patient was gone for a full bilateral dissection. And I have uh, seen a lot of Indian surgeons still in India, they believe that they do the full template on each side, even if the landing zone is one side only, and even if the disease is of low volume. So this is the usual uh, classic picture of the uh, bilateral template with all its morbidity from the big wound to the lack of the ejaculation that can result from such extensive surgery. So if we look what happened in the last decade for the surgery part, we have seen what happened with the chemotherapy and radiotherapy. We have seen growing evidence to support monolateral modified template, which can be safely uh, performed for relatively small residual masses after chemotherapy. And the primary end point of the surgery, as we all believe, is the cure of the disease. And if we look really in the literature, uh, of cases of post-chemo, uh, whether it's done by open, laparoscopic, and even if we look for primary cases of retroperitoneal done open, laparoscopic, or robotically, we will find very uh, small number of studies looking for the retrograde ejaculation. For example, this is among the large volume cases, a uh, series of primary laparoscopic retroperitoneal, and we can see what, six or seven studies only looking for the functional outcome rather than just the oncological outcome. And similar things happen with the post-chemo, with the laparoscopy, and also with the large series of uh, uh, open, uh, uh, primary open, or the robotic uh, series as well. So how the idea comes in the post-chemo that probably we should what we call it tempered the wind to the shore and lamb because they are already have 
subnormal seminal fluid analysis before the treatment and then they will have chemo most of them they don't get the chance to have sperm banking and again we will come with the surgery and do very very extensive surgery that lead to the majority of them they have dry ejaculate so all this experience accumulated first of all from the primary retroperitoneal in stage one which is changed considerably considerably over the last three decades from full bilateral suprahilar to modified unilateral in a concept what we call it the nerve sparing template uh, i so, will interrupt sir one question here yeah. uh, if we do full bilateral suprahilar dissection apart from the ejaculation issues i feel there will be a lot of complication related to the lymphatic uh, 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 obstruction of the lower limbs, uh, lymphocele, also the morbidity of the such an extensive surgery common to all uh, testicular cancers should not be there now, I think. Agreed. Agreed. It's a morbid surgery by all means, really. Yeah, it's a morbid and, surgery. Exactly. And in addition to that, as you pointed out earlier, it needs a specialized center with large volume people who train how to do this and how to improve this outcome. Yeah, yeah. So, yes. again, if we look at the evolving pathway of the retroperitoneal lap dissection, uh, lymph node dissection, if they see this extent of the earlier series, and then comes the modified, and then uh, right and left. And again, even with the modified, we have different among different centers. For example, this schematic demonstration represent uh, how they do it in a free big cancer center in the state, uh, specialized in testicular cancer treatment like Indiana, MD Anderson, and Sloan Kettering. We can see there is no agreement what, what, what are the limits or the boundaries of the dissection. And if that tells us something, uh, probably tells us that we don't have really a strong evidence that what, what is the right things to do for every patient. And I'm a big believer in a strategy called the three I. Okay. The three I represent, first of all, identify the right patient. Second, to individualize. The second I is to individualize the right treatment for that right identified patient in order to have the th third I, which is improve his outcome. So there is no one surgery can fit everybody. As we know, there is no one size shirt can fit uh, everyone. And again, we have what we call it the personalized medicine, which we can apply it especially in the decision about what we do for every patient and every case uh, we, after we uh, examine it on individual level. So again, this is the left. Again, there is no agreement between the three centers about how we do it, but they are probably in general very close to each other in order to reduce the morbidity and improve the outcome, the functional outcome of the patient. And also all of them, they showed that adoption, any of these template did not uh, compromise the oncological outcome as well. Okay. So, where come this idea of the modified uh, template? This is an important study done by the late famous John Donohue, who is the father of modern retroperitoneal lymph node dissection from Indiana. He looked in the distribution of nodal metastasis in non cinematous testicular germ cell tumor. And what did they find? Basically, based on early experience from primary retroperitoneal mapping study, demonstrated that the lymphatic spread metastasis right of the vena cava in patient with left-sided cancer has only happened in a three to seven percent. So if we do complete template, it means that we over-treat around 90 percent of the patient or more than 90 percent of the patient. And really if we look what is the fingerprint of testicular cancer besides it being curable disease, I think it is an overtreated disease, whether by chemotherapy, whether by radiotherapy, or by extent of surgery we do. And similarly, they saw the crossover metastasis of left of the aorta were more common in patients on the right side, but still it's less than 20%. So if we do surgery 
For a right-sided, in a full template, we are treating, over-treating more than 80% of the patient. Similarly, this is a very interesting study. This is done on a patient with bilateral retroperitoneal post-chemo for stage 2A or 2B. And what did they find? They find that no single patient have metastasis on the right side of the aorta for a left side tumor. And oh. their conclusion that it may be safe to perform a left modified dissection in a patient with a left sided tumor. And the evidence started growing more. And uh, this is again uh, another important question published in Cancer 2007 is full bilateral required for every patient? And also supported by another study from the Axel uh, Heidenreich uh, post chemotherapy retroperitoneal, should we go for radical or modified? And both of them, they find that modified unilateral, either right or left, may be safe for the selected patient. And that's what I'm talking, talking about, the individualized or the personalized uh, decision for every patient, rather than uh, just we go by routine, full template, as it was historically, or as we got it as a legacy from our uh, predecessor surgeon. So if the tumor is small, less than five centimeter, confined to the landing zone on one side of the abdomen, then probably if we do modified, it will not interfere with the oncological, but definitely decrease the treatment associated morbidity and also maintain a good uh, functional outcome regarding the observation of the patient ejaculation. Yeah. So. I'm just putting this case, uh, Chandra. Uh, this patient came to me really from Iraq. He had left-sided orchidectomy for testicular cancer and his histology showed mixed germ cell tumor, 75 embryonal carcinoma, 15 yolk sac, seminoma 5%. And I looked even in the review of the slides at our center and we couldn't find any teratoma, but there was lymphovascular invasion. His tumor marker was elevated, but were within the a good prognostic metastatic group. And uh, the primary landing zone of the METS was left, template, and his metastatic volume was very small. It's around two centimeter. So he was treated by three cycle initially. And when they repeat the image, the tumor marker was normalized, but the mass was there from two to 1.7. And the decision was to give him a fourth cycle. And in here, probably this is quite unnecessary to give a fourth cycle with all the side effects. And what I would like here to address for a new generation of medical oncologists and surgeons as well, that we have a concept, we call it the growing teratoma syndrome. Sure. The growing teratoma syndrome that in mixed germ cell tumor, if we give two cycles of chemotherapy, and we have normal or normalized tumor marker. However, we have residual masses or growing masses started to grow on follow-up. Please stop chemotherapy and decide to have MDC meeting to uh, have the decision for uh, retroperitoneal lymph node dissection in this case. And if we look to great center like MD Anderson, which call it MD Anderson, no cancer center, and we see that when they first describe the growing teratoma syndrome, they have patient who had 12 cycles of chemotherapy, spent two to three years having chemotherapy for masses, residual masses in their abdomen, which grew from like five centimeter to 20 centimeter in order to decide to stop chemo and decide to have surgery at that stage. Unfortunately, even in our locality, even with the in uh, a lot of education about this possibility, still we have patients like this. Yesterday, I did open retroperitoneal lymph node dissection for 10 by 16 centimeter mass. And if I looked, when I looked in his CT scan before, last year he had a mass about two to three centimeter, which was left for follow up after chemo. Okay. And by his chemotherapy, every time they repeat, it was an increasing in size. But just now, when it was 16 by 10, they decided to refer him for me. And yesterday, I did a very challenging surgery. 
I couldn't separate the mass from the left renal vein and the ureter and the artery and the aorta. Even the superior mesenteric artery was encased. It took me four hours really of meticulous dissection in order to remove the mass and to preserve the vessels and the kidney. So we don't re need really to reach such. The best way to deal with the growing teratoma syndrome is the prevention. As I said, after two cycles, please, if you do a normal tumor marker is normalized or normal, we should stop chemo and consider retroperitoneal for the, the growing teratoma because most of the cases such, more than 50%, they will have teratoma only. Okay. So we ha he, the patient had also very small paraortic lymph nodes considered as non-specific, but the main one is a mass attached to the left renal artery with normal tumor marker. He was referred to me for the uh, laparoscopic retroperitoneal lymph node dissection. When we discussed the picture with my team, they said, well, this is piece of cake case. We can go and remove that small lymph nodes here attached to the vein, all right? Because it, the fat look not toxic, the abdomen look clean and we don't have much. So we decide to go for the modified uh, uh, tumor plate. But let us say how, how the things looks inside the laparoscopy field. So in my opinion, what advice I should give? This is not an operation for a junior laparoscopist. Yeah. I, 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 I did this, I start doing this procedure after doing hundreds of radical prostatectomies, partial nephrectomies, uh, pyeloplasties, retroperitone, uh, sorry, uh, pelvic lymphadenectomies. And then I, let us say, have the final decision to go for doing these cases. And I started, first of all, with uh, primary retroperitoneal. I start doing them, first of all, retroperitoneal, but I then changed to the transperitoneal because it was much comfortable for everyone, the assistant and me, to do its transperitoneal uh, technique. So what I advise them, please let this to be your last uh, experience uh, uh, yeah. job to do. And when you decide to do this job, please study the CT scan very well with your radiologist. And uh, nowadays we have excellent image and we have way to see them. So you have spent good time to do that. Again, get the best assistant and the best OR nurse to help you on such operation. Get the open tray standby. You have rescue stage prepared five or five, four or proline on hemolog uh, clip. Get a free bulldog smart with long stitch to get them inside and do uh, uh, compression distal and uh, proximal if you have any vascular injury. Get uh, free four by four or 10 by 10 with peanut uh, on uh, clip on, on, on uh, a tooth forceps in order to put it as compression if you have a bleeding and be ready to put one or more extra five millimeter trocker to help you for the assistant and in uh, doing uh, uh, retraction. For me, really, I don't recommend uh, monopolar scissor for such operation. And I have seen very senior people doing this and they perforate the aorta and they have catastroph catastrophic uh, situation. Even for them with their experience, they, they couldn't even to convert to open and they lost the patient. So I would say harmonic and Thunderbeat works in my hand very well and they are much safer than monopolar scissor. However, I do use a system as well. So what I do, I put the patient for the modified in lateral position, and I put free trockers at the pararectal level, similar to the robotic one, the, uh, the XI, and I get the camera the most top with the assistant there with all his connection, and I, uh, uh, stand at his right side with my two trockers to work. So we separate, he has his compartment and I have my compartment and we don't clash with each other. And I don't put my hands over his camera hands. And again, I find it really very comfortable to my shoulder as well to work in this way rather than that way. Uh, I usually put the monitor at the top this behind, uh, beside the head and I put everything else uh, uh, below the monitor. I give a prophylactic antibiotic and anti uh, and uh, anticoagulation at the time of the induction. I don't do any bowel preparation for retroperitoneal front dissection, and also I don't refrain the patient from eating a fat uh, food 
for the last three days. Why? Because I don't believe in the bowel preparation that it will make any good uh, and during the surgery. And, and we have many studies showed the reverse regarding leak, regarding the distension, especially in laparoscopy. And yeah. also I don't stop the fat because I want to see the chyle leak during the surgery so that if there I can fix it rather than pass unnoticed and result in chylus ascites uh, afterwards. Okay. And this is a short video just to show the quality of tissue, how you see quality of tissue after four uh, or four cycles of chemotherapy. Definitely two better than two than one and three better than two and four better than three. I have operated on different patients with different cycles, but definitely after four cycle of uh, PEP, you will find the tissue. You can't differentiate the fat from the normal tissue from the tumor. And as you can see here, uh, This is the vein and the gonadal vein, and you can see the mass uh, landing just adherent to the anterior surface of the vein. I find the section is a very good blunt tool to help finding a plan to work. And again, when you dissect and when you use the harmonic, please get it cooled by the tumor cells rather than touching the vein because the temperature can be tremendous and can cause visual injury by thermal rather than direct puncture. So step by step, I try to find some space in order to separate the mass. And we can, first of all, I couldn't separate it from the vein, so I went around. I get it all freed so that I can hold it in my hand and uh, directed it up and down in order to find which is the safest way to go around the vein. And you can see the quality of the tissue, really the vein, the tissue, the fat, everything look in a durated and uh, toxic appearance rather than the normal hilum we see in the nephrectomy. Uh, so we go on even uh, until we see the normal fat. And as you can see, this is the way I adapt, always keep the harmonic parallel to the tissue rather than you point it like this. I have seen one of the Indian surgeon during dissection of the ureter, he perforated the external iliac artery by the tip of the harmonic because it's so hot. So always keep parallel in order to avoid the tips of the uh, harmonic scalpel from doing the damage. And that's what I mean. And here we can see the, when we reach the fat part, then we can transect the main part before doing the remnant uh, template. When you have such a lesion free in the abdomen, try to fix it by clips or something. That's what I did to the surrounding tissue because you might, sometime you can lose it. One time I lost partial nephrectomy and I spent 45 minutes looking for it in the inside the abdomen. Uh, very important here, I will just stop a bit very important to remove the whole uh, gonadal vein. And oh. an advice I give it to the people doing radical orchidectomy, because some senior consider radical orchidectomy proper operation can be given very easy to the resident to do it. I find it it's a radical, so it needs really special care. And my main concern with the radical nephrectomy is not to deliver the testis. I can do this through any incision. So what I do, usually I do transverse incision high over the internal ring, and I go and dissect the cord below the peritoneum, as if we do in the orchidopexy for high uh, uh, undescended testis. Yeah. And then I put open uh, right angle hemolock eclipse to very deep below the internal ring. Okay. In the peritoneal, and at that stage, I transect the cord so that when I come and do retroperitoneal, I find the clips, I can see them okay. uh, before the internal ring and then, then to ensure complete removal of the cord because sometimes can be the only site of recurrence after retroperitoneal after dissection. Okay. Here, the ureter, sorry, the ureter here, uh, 
ureter can be suspended with trans skin, uh, like crawling or silk, and elevated as, as you can see here, so that you get it away from the harm hand and you can work with two hands because you have just two trockers for me and I can dissect, I can see the aorta with all the attached lymph nodes and then we can work uh, safely away from the ureter and using the two hands rather than using the one hand to retract the ureter. When we have feeding vessels, sometimes you can find very large feeding vessels from the aorta to the lymph nodes. I would prefer to use hemolock eclipse rather than metallic eclipse because with the mechanical work of the aorta, you might get slips, some of them. And I would always put uh, for large vessels uh, uh, hemolock. Then we look for the uh, inferior mesenteric artery as uh, a landmark in order not to go further uh, anterior to the aorta below that space in order to preserve the hypogastric uh, plexus with the postganglionic nerves coming from the other sides. And you can see here's another feeding vessels very gently separated with the right angle and then controlled with the hemolytic clip as well. Don't do very much dissection close to the aorta because even in the young age group, really, you can devote the aorta from adventitial uh, uh, cover, and this might lead to weakening and can result in aneurysmal dilatation even at the end, young age group. Then we go uh, from either when we use when we uh, reach the lower limit, we go all around to remove the uh, the whole lymph nodes. And here we can see this is the vein uh, with the, there was the lymph nodes and this is the aorta. And here is the inferior mesenteric and that's the para-aortic part, which is all removed. Okay. Uh, here is the whole cord, as I said, I, 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 I uh, constrate very much removing the whole cord in every case. And this is the outcome if compared to the open technique. And uh, just the three, and the patient was discharged really on uh, day two after the surgery with uh, an eventful course. Histopathology, interestingly, showed mature teratoma as expected in two nodes, but we have one microscopic foci of uh, focus, sorry, of embryonal carcinoma in one lymph node. The gonadal vessels was free. And again here, because we removed the whole paraortic part, and there was only one focus of embryonal carcinoma. We had MDC meeting with our medical oncologist, and they decide that probably the surgery alone is curable. And we put him for one year, every six months image, and also every three months tumor marker. And after a good follow-up of three years, we didn't get any uh, recurrence or relapse of the disease. And also, this explained that probably surgery can be curable, even if we have small volume or small foci of cancer detected, and we can avoid further chemotherapy in such patients. This is, we can see here in the, uh, we can see the cartilage, the osseous uh, part of the teratoma, and here is the embryonic carcinoma focus, which we uh, saw in one of the lymph nodes. And uh, here's some slide of ciliated respiratory epithelium, cartilage, and other part of the teratoma. Three years of serial image, as I said, he has no problem. And uh, we are very happy to see that his integrated ejaculation is preserved. And he contacted me to tell me that his father a new child. And he called him after my name as well. Oh, great. <laughs> <laughs> great. Thank you very much. So, uh, uh, is it done, presentation? Yes. Yeah, because I want to see this slide. <laughs> uh, this is the last slide. British yeah, Museum is, Place is, Culture. Is, you know, I'm, I'm, as I said, I'm from Mesopotamia. Yeah, yeah. This is a very famous sculpture present in the British Museum about a lady. So I think we, as old Iraqis, we respect ladies very much. As we can see, she stepped on two lions okay. and present the power and holding uh, in her hands one stick and one some curved things represent to the love and war. And this is Ishtar, the goddess of love and, uh, and uh, war. 
War. Oh. So, uh, we are very proud about this, uh, and we have a lot of them, unfortunately, looted during the invasion of Iraq. Thousands of pieces now present all over the world, and uh, what left in Iraq is very yes. uh, small part of that big treasure we had at some time. Oh, very sad to know that, but a uh, beautiful picture. Thanks. So, I like to ask some questions. Sure. and. Uh, I stop uh, sharing. Yeah, yeah, please, sir. Uh, this is an excellent talk, sir. Uh, I can, uh, I can, as a surgeon, I can easily say that this with a lot of experience, a lot of experience. With that uh, sh short video, I can easily see what happens there. What I can imagine this type of surgery is like simple xanthogranulomatous pyelonephritis when you do on the right side. When you are dissecting I remember, the region, I remember your video. <laughs> yes, sir. When, when, you, when you do on the right side, uh, everybody will have nightmare regarding the renal vein as well as the duodenum. Right. Unless you use a proper right angle or suction. If you are continuously using any energy source, especially monopolar, it is not at all a good surgery. Same thing I am seeing here because I have not done this surgery. I'm, I'm, I don't know whether uh, I'm eligible or not. I'm waiting for the case even with the help of the senior. I wanted to do it, but I never got it. I think you are eligible, Chandra. You are an excellent surgeon. Uh, the second case, uh, similar thing what I have seen is post, uh, even though, uh, because it's a surgical technique based program I am mentioning, post uh, ectopic kidney pyeloplasty, adult presented with pyonephrosis with a large hydronephrotic kidney completely struck to the okay. left side of the uh, iliac vessels without having much idea about what's on the posterior aspect I was dissecting, I emptied and uh, I was going close to the kidney, very close to the kidney. But only thing is that it was not in my mind that I am very nearer to the external iliac vein. I was doing very small the way you have shown, but my blades are not the old type of harmonic. That's good. Now the new harmonic has a little sharper edge so that you can dissect a little bit, but at the same time it can perforate. So I have perforated the external iliac vein. This is the only significant injury I had in my career. Fortunately, the suction which has come has stopped that bleeding and then I could take with rescue stitch. So when I have seen your list of uh, uh, one slide where you have put a rescue stitch, a uh, 50 proline with this thing. So my first question is, when you start the left or right side lymphadenectomy retroperitoneum in that region what level you will mobilize the colon right from the sigmoid up to the this is my first question because for imagination sure. uh, it can't be supine it should be some elevation on the opposite side so that it will fall back you are done only with three instruments these the colon should be completely away sure. uh, either head and down and uh, ipsilateral side upside how much we have to do is my first question well especially on the left side yes sir i mobilize well, from the spleen yeah down, down to the iliac area all so all see it during my work and that's also i do it during nephrectomy as well that's why i haven't seen a colon or intestine anywhere yeah. near the because nowhere the if the colon dropped well, it will take with it the whole small bowel. Yeah, yeah. It will take yeah. into the bag. Also, the camera at the same level. Yeah. So that every, we work at the same uh, scene, you know. Yes. Other than putting the camera down and you will see the... And I use zero. Always I use zero. Oh. So the my, my, my second question is... Most of the surgical principles of laparoscopy where you put the camera in the front, you emphasized and pointed out that you have gone to the topmost port so that nobody intervene and your hands are free and all of them are in one line. This type of surgery we do in pediatric pyeloplasty where in one line where the abdomen is not there. 
and you have gone for ipsilateral in the pararectal region my basic doubt is you will be you will be working a little bit vertical on to the like in robo you will not have angle you your hands are vertically down is it no if you put them pararectal pararectal on the ipsilateral or opposite side no no on the same side then uh, uh, yeah. how is it possible to go uh, to the center it will be vertical uh, i mean almost you will be operating directly on to the specimen no no <laughs> so what you do you get the table you know very down okay. very down very down yeah, very low i put it that very must. Low. that right. is must uh, and the, as i said the because the uh, assistance is on your other side so you don't yeah. interfere with them and you yeah. work just yeah like. that's a very good point okay yeah. and even nowadays i have changed my configuration of the trockers because i have problem with my right shoulder okay so i'm now doing what the camera is the same place okay but I put the, the assistant will stop on the other side okay with this, uh, uh, with another trucker to be for for the section and i put triangle below the camera so that i will work in what you call more yeah. down uh, no abduction for yes. the shot no and abduction yes for everything for everything 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 okay that i understand only if the camera goes away from both the ports then you need a little bit of a mental adjustment for the uh, movements of the arms because most of the times the baseball Uh, principle of uh, uh, laparoscopy is deviated here grossly the camera is on the top this we will do when you wanted to do uh, uh, either uh, posterior to hilum in nephrectomy or when you wanted to do supra hilar adrenalectomy where you you change the ports uh, recently dr uh, um, uh, um, george pisar has presented that he uses all 10 mm ports That's all right. the, all the 10 mm what i do yeah I I use two camera, one five and one ten. Oh, so mm. I can if I have problem. For example, in that case, in order to reach to the internal ring, yeah, the at the top, yeah, then probably sometime you need to change the camera sides. And I have two cameras, so I uh, sorry, two lenses, so okay. that I can change the lenses anytime. But five mm camera is very useful. Five mm yeah. camera is. I don't like. I don't want. Uh, putting my hands over my assistant i don't like that yeah all. that is cumbersome and working with this way i think uh, first of all your shoulder in front right. of it should be it. never raised and okay. you will raise them and that's what right. happened to me because initially i was doing this and Moment then you raise I, i find this way very useful very comfortable to my shoulder as well okay my third question always this surgery is first landmark to be identified is the renal vein in all these surgeries what is your first where you wanted to start safely is it renal vein naturally i feel it is renal vein yeah so what i do really after i drop the uh, the colon for example let us talk about the left side okay i have everything ready above and below the hilum okay so that when i look for the hilum i yes. know where is it yes all right and usually usually we start from the lower pole while yeah. in rectomy i start all the time in the upper pole but in such cases i go from the lower pole looking for the gonadal vessels okay and then trace the gonadal up to the renal vein because in that case the 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 landing mass was there so oh, always okay. in your case in your case predominantly the mass was in that region yeah. so you primarily focus but otherwise in a case of routine rpl and d you start somewhere at the renal hilum only naturally no no you can no? start you can start from the aorta downwards and then you follow up but in Is that it? case because i you know i did it the video to show the main steps yeah, yeah i got the point that mass because of the limit of the time and yes uh, i was to talk about the technique and something and it's 20 minutes to stick in that time but usually you get everything ready from the aorta and you can see even when i was working with the renal vein the aorta was in the view because i already get yeah. it right yes. yeah. usually get the uh, gonadal vein yeah. and, and 
Yeah. You will find it. That's very important point. Most of the junior, they mistaken the gonadal vein with the inferior mesenteric vein. The inferior mesenteric outside the gerota, while the gonadal is inside the gerota. So you need to open the gerota to see the gonadal. And then when you just lift the gonadal, okay. you will lift the ureter as well, and you will see the psoas. Yeah. And then slowly, slowly go until you will see the aorta. Once yeah. you see the aorta, you can dissect the whole things away okay. from the aorta. And yeah. if you have mass, then you tackle it separately. Okay. Now, my fourth question. Do you ever uh, go uh, posteriorly, especially when you are dissecting aortocaval lymph nodes, do you need to rotate these major vessels? If so, what are the important unnamed vessels that can trouble you? Honestly, Chandra, if there is such a case that needs such extensive surgery, I will do safest open technique. Open technique. Yeah, because, you know, I mean, the safety is the most important part. If we can combine minimal invasive with reasonable outcome through the laparoscopy is fine. But that was your first slide. Not an exercise of surgery or heroic uh, proof to prove what you can do. That was your first Sometimes slide. I attend uh, challenges in laparoscopy and robotic and honestly when i see like famous surgeon like uh, andy gill i i don't agree with what what he's doing for very difficult partial and compromising all the for me the oncological principles of surgery in order just to prove that we can do such case robotically for example still yeah. i believe if we can do it in a reasonable way yes but if i, I have done such cases where I can put my fingers below the aorta and the vena cava when it's indicated, when it's there is a proof by image that we have a landing lymph nodes in that area. The yeah. most important things here is the lumbar vessels. Lumbar vessels. Lumbar vessels. What we can do there is a small temporary clips. You can put them in yeah. order to work there, and then you can remove them at the end because compromising too many lumbar vessels from the aorta it might affect really the supply of the, sperm, of the spinal cord. Okay. You might have problem afterwards with the supply and also with the sensation and motor movement in the legs for the patient. You should be very careful. Okay. Now, my fifth question. Uh, the You said that after multiple cycles of chemotherapy, the plane the thinness, the difficulty in dissection will increase. How do you compare post radiotherapy versus post chemotherapy? Why I'm asking this question is post radiotherapy for carcinoma cervix sometimes or carcinoma bladder sometimes we do ileum salvage cystectomy. Sure. Our main worry is post radiotherapy ileum or intestine will be severely affected in terms of the blood supply. How do you compare radiotherapy and chemotherapy in terms of tissue dissection during laparoscopy or robotic? So by all means, give me chemo, don't give me radio. <laughs> Case. <laughs> by all means, radio, chemotherapy is better than radiotherapy, especially if the time of the radiation is, is like three, four years ago, then you will have really cemented uh, field. It's very difficult. Then, as you said, salvage cystectomies, three or five years or even 10 years, and still really you can't find any plane. Any that's plane. Why, and that's why in the salvage, you know, we don't do lymph nodes because sometimes we can't see really yeah. the vessels. You can't see anything. I would say chemo, even if four Reasonably cycles, okay. In my, in my opinion. Uh, this is a difficult, uh, uh, in terms of the technique wise, I'm asking, if you normally any vessel, now adventia is the one structure which gives some clue, even in your case, which we have shown, you were able to dissect uh, slowly and uh, identify one big vessel, uh, unnamed vessel coming and you clipped with a long clip. If repeatedly, if you are having problem in developing a plane where traditionally you make entire vessel nude. If that is not possible, 
that is a that is the only thing that was there in my mind that if everything is plastered you have to release small small tissues with right angle and keep on going can we do extensively in such case and if there are any areas like yesterday you were telling 4 hours of surgery most of the times if you are patient enough can you develop a good plane where the aorta is not injured without injuring can you come out what are the tips and tricks it's a, it's a, i can imagine 4 hours when you have done open surgery look on first nowadays we have excellent image really can tell us whether the aorta is compressed or it is more than compression by will you image. depend on ct or mri uh, ct ct or the tropotonial ct contrast ct contrast ct of course when yeah. we have triphasic we do triphasic triphasic contrast ct for turbinas and then we do the excretory okay and if as i said i'm a very safe surgeon i do what i i think is safe for the patient there is no point to just to struggle for hours in order to find the plane by laparoscopy and any time if anything to the happen to the aorta then probably you can't salvage the whole situation even pressure you put it on yourself your staff the anesthetist if i have such cases i will go open i have vascular surgeon with me and we prepare and we counsel the patient about even uh, aortic substitution by graft in such cases if okay. there is no plane usually we go from known to unknown i look for a place where can i see for example the uh, aorta if we go first of all over the bifurcation of the aorta and you slowly dissect if yeah. it works it's fine but if you stop stop change the strategy that's okay. my advice narrow down to the problem so that other areas you dissect and come to the last part and probably you may leave or you do whatever the other methods to exactly. do that okay uh, usually in uh, radical cystectomy or prostatectomy nowadays they are saying that both the specimen lymphadenectomy should have around 25 lymph nodes i was expecting a comment on that from you that in a unilateral template in a modified method if you do how many lymph nodes normally we can expect that's an excellent question if we look for many cases for example of cystectomy we do yes sir And every time for example for me i'm very much classic surgeon doing cystectomy i have nine station to do lymphadenectomy and every time i do it the same way Great. sometime i got 52 lymph nodes and sometime i got 12 lymph nodes yeah. however i do the same in my belief lymph nodes in the same area they are different with every patient oh, yeah. my impression thin patient not fatty patient they have less number of lymph nodes lymph nodes so fatty patients they got more number of lymph nodes and we 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 did it different way. Sometimes we send it separate. Like this is the external iliac, this is the hypogastric, this is the obturator, and that really didn't change much about yeah. the, uh, the the yield number. For the uh, retroperitoneal lymph node dissection, I remember the first case I did it when I came back from Ireland at King Hussein Cancer Center. I have very senior uh, colleague doing open retroperitoneal. and it happened that two cases presented in the mdc i have the laparoscopic one and there was something like 20 lymph nodes in him but he was a young guy and his patient has seven lymph nodes okay. however he did it in open technique and i have no doubt that he did it in superb way so the number is different really and i think if you follow templates if you follow boundaries and you remove them all that's what matter more rather than a number So it's an anatomical dissection. What contains is different, but its anatomy has to be maintained all around and remove the template yeah. properly. Uh, in uh, uh, lymphocil during uh, uh, transplant is a major concern. Limb edema and lymphocil. What is your comment in this complex surgeries? Uh, what is your experience? Yeah. Uh, I, I have DVT. I, I want to have a an opinion on you. DVT. Uh, uh, do you raise the legs and take all the precautions of uh, uh, elastic stocking, intermittent, everything? A comment on the lymphedema, venous stasis, and lymphoid uh, postoperative lymphoid. 
how, how have, manage? We have, we have a routine in this. We give anticoagulation at the time of induction and in major pelvic surgeries. We keep all, all cases. For all cases. We 40 to 60 the, mg uh, low molecular weight heparin like that. Yeah, we give uh, uh, low molecular weight heparin, and we give the dose according to the body weight of the patients. For for example, I did. Uh, uh, recent pyroplasty, probably you comment about the picture of it. The, the lady is huge. She has a very large BMI. I gave her for 10 days post the procedure, uh, low molecular weight, heparin as well. And also we put every patient with stockings and compression boots and in doing the uh, cystectomy or prostatectomy. In male, I usually don't raise the legs. I usually put them supine, all okay. right? Okay. Unless I'm doing a concomitant urethrectomy, that's okay. different. Okay. But uh, for uh, uh, for uh, retroperitoneal lymph node dissection, I was quite fortunate. I really didn't get any patient who had leg edema or get uh, chylus ascites so far. Okay. But I have seen a lot of genitalia edema, lower limb edema after cystectomy when I go and dissect lateral to the to the external iliac artery. Okay. So, you know, the boundary is saying from the genital femoral, but I'm very cautious nowadays doing more dissection lateral. In my belief, I couldn't get any really single metastasis in that area. Okay. If the image or on, uh, on the time of surgery, there is no suspicious lymph node, I don't go lateral to the artery. Uh, in uh, open surgery, we have seen traditionally right angle with suturing of the silk long back uh, all the all the lymph nodes pelvic lymphadenectomy take one centimeter bites keep on maybe people like studer they they ligate slowly it has gone into monopolar now it has gone into this thing do you think it is safe when you are coming at least so in between part is okay the lowest part highest part where large lymphatics are there you prefer to clip them at least dissecting one centimeter area or you buzz and cut it buzz and cut it is easy more uh, i mean it looks a fast quick but but uh, yeah I, I will i will tell you honestly more whatever you do you will get the look for seal that's not only my impression that's really everybody impression but if you use nowadays the new energy like uh, Ligasure or uh, Harmonic, probably we, we believe we did something. But the problem with the lymphatic vessels, they have no muscle wall. Yeah, no muscle wall. Then probably... They don't... These, uh, exactly. These things cannot do lymphostasis. Yes. But definitely what I do, when you, as you said, the most distant and the most proximal, when I find a big connection of the junks of the lymph node, I put clips there. That's the only place I put clips. Yeah, that's and what I want to know. And I then... Let's I talk about it. Oh, no wait. problem. That's that exactly I want to know. But honestly... My last question. Whatever, whatever you do, you will get. Not get uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, probably my last question. Uh, after that, I will just address what the audience have told. Uh, the... <laughs> you see that sometimes even PCNL surgery, uh, or a simple retroperitoneal surgery or some amount of the uh, urine leak in the post TURP also can cause retroperitonism plus paralytic ileus very badly. Oh my God, badly that uh, four to five days you can't give anything to the patient. Uh, is it also common in this uh, surgery where you go so medially? Some parasympathetic and sympathetic systems also may get disconnected, especially in obese patients. It puts postoperatively a lot of stress to the surgeon. This is my last question. Uh, if you do extensive surgery in the uh, aortic region, do you see postoperative or they do very well? Sure. Definitely after laparoscopy, the, the recovery is much quick and much better and even for the bowel really. But if we do more extensive open surgery, for example, like the patient. Yeah, you are showing that uh, big I line. Saw, I just saw him now because I'm in the, my clinic in the hospital. Yes. Uh, you you feel them not comfortable. You feel them sweaty, tachycardic. Yeah. However, yeah, yeah. If, you, 
if you look to this the chart they got adequate uh, iv fluid yes yes so much pain, all right but still if you look at him you don't seem comfortable like the other type of surgery i yes, agree with yes, you sir. but yes. what i do chandra and i found it very helpful i do suture the peritoneum after i finish I okay. cover everything with peritoneum. And I learned this really from a very famous uh, Irish surgeon. He said that in his case, if he do reperitonization after yeah. this large area, even his uh, 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 chylus ascites, lymphocele collection is, is, is much less than the... Compresses, a sort of compress. One thing I didn't mention it in my presentation, I don't use drain at all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I, I don't okay. like the drain. Even in the nephrectomy, even if I do very big nephrectomy lab open, I don't use a drain. Okay. And one time when my yeah. assistant insists to put a drain for left side big tumor, and I didn't, I didn't listen to him, and the patient has some pancreatic leak, which was oh, really oh. so. Yeah, and we had to do percutaneous drainage. Why I don't use a drain? Because I think a drain. That's just I'm saying this. Because yeah. I think the drain is an old legacy. We got it from the time where no image there and no interventional radiologist was there. So okay. they said, if you want to sleep safe, put a drain. But yeah. the problem is, when I did my fellowship in the state with uh, the famous Andrew Albertino, uh, we were doing nephrectomy. And I said, would you put a drain? Because that's what I you know, taught to do, to put a drain after each nephrectomy. He said, no, Khaled. I will not put a drain because I had nephrectomy. That's what he said. I yeah, said, I yeah. had nephrectomy myself by David Parrott, who is also very famous in Lakey Clinic. He said, no pain from the wound, all the pain from the drain. And then because I, it, moves, it moves and irritates. Exactly. And he, that he said, I will never put a drain. And I learned that from him, apply it. Because nowadays we have interventional radiology. We can do it under local what can happen? Two or three percent, we can save 95 percent of the patients from, from the pain. I agree. Uh, it's uh, debatable, but I agree that, uh, especially in surgeries where. As, as a routine, I mean. As intestine, a it is uh, not involved. Even intestinal surgery, general surgeons and the GA surgeons say that intestinal anastomosis, they don't put drain. Now, they even don't put partial nephrectomy, they don't put a drain. They, they don't put drain. Okay, fine. Yeah. If the patient is deteriorating, better to know early what it is with ultrasound and then open or do drain later on. Because in my belief, oh. uh, bleeding will not shown by drain at all. In the, the in, in relevant to the same question, to avoid the too much distension of abdomen, do people recommend interrupted uh, far near near far suturing of the abdomen in such uh, major surgeries, especially with obesity, or you do continuous uh, single uh, uh, open surgery? Like yesterday, what you have done? For continuous suturing? For the wound? Uh, for the wound, of course, yeah. I usually use two BDS loop, one at the top oh. and one the, at the end, and then I meet them, tie them separately, and then I cross with the second one, the first one, by two or three stages, and then I, I tie it in a special way through the loop. I cut it and then I tie it. I to fine, use fine. Mass, mass closure. Uh, yeah, fine. Mass closure is better and uh, come crossing over should be there so that at least one centimeter gap is there. It is risky. That is what uh, you mean to say that you go that side and you come this side, close it yeah. there. So some of the comments uh, is uh, Dr. Siddhilinga Swami, excellent presentation and a very good, very good pre-operative preparation. Madhav Tiwari sir said that, thank you for an excellent talk. What is the difference uh, in feel of the nodes post 1, 2, 3, chemo, etc. Feel of the lymph nodes, he uh, is asking. Do you, do you feel? That. Yeah, I already asked. You mentioned that 2, 3, 4 like that you mentioned. Dr. Rubin Singh said that it is great talk. Madhav Tiwari again asked a question. He is active. Unrelated to this presentation, you said you have the three ports in the pararectal line. We all follow easier in standard triangularization. Do you find difficulty in this three one line? This is the only thing new we have learned today. I'm happy that your assistant will be away. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, with the experience, I think you will adapt okay. where you are operating. This is back from the assistant. Yeah, very nice. <laughs> they said right. you can't, you know, after feeling like yeah. Every time you raise your shoulder, adjust to him right. and doesn't look nice. That's correct. Adan Adam said, uh, uh, maybe he knows you and nice informative. Thank you, sir. Haider Hussain also said, great information. Thank you so much. Some of your followers are also there. I, I never thought uh, 
you are doing so much uh, work on this it is a complicated very few unknowingly or knowingly uh, i got introduced to you uh, really it was very informative because we very few in india also do this surgery unless mass volumes like tata uh, these type of centers who are dedicated uh, for the cancer gu uh, genita urinary then only you will get this volumes otherwise it's uh, uh, even routine teaching institution does not get this type of uh, surgeries thank you very much sir this is not routine surgery i am very thankful and in future i will be very happy uh, to know about the radical prostatectomy also because you discuss very often right, one uh, uh, yeah 20 30 minute surgery i wanted to see are you doing robo now uh you know are you using robo now yeah since i left ireland really and now it's more than 5 years i haven't done any robotic surgery but as you i are doing that now we get the robot installed and then we get the train we are training the people now and uh, probably in the next month or two we will start with the prostate that's what i said let us first of all start with pelvic surgery because i learned that from uh, ahlawat from india ahlawat yes sir yes sir rajesh ahlawat yes, he said extraordinary laparoscopic surgery yeah, and uh, i like that because he said uh, he start getting a lot of cervical pain from the laparoscopy and the endourology and now he's enjoying doing the console yeah he now no more he demonstrate lab he was an excellent lab surgeon yeah he said that start after one year of doing pelvic surgery on robot then he start to shift to the kidney because you know working within 10 15 cm is not like 40 cm with cava yeah. aorta renal vein you need to have very trained people very oriented with the pelvic because it's kind of you know controlled yeah of operation and then we go to the kidney as well after that's, that's the important point is other way around in laparoscopy actually <laughs> it's exactly it's exactly the reverse way because you reverse way. <laughs> end of the I can year. understand what exactly you mean the assistance for everybody everything is under vision in robotic in pelvis but not in uh, so it's a coordination between two persons at different places so sure. hope uh, you will come up with a uh, good robotic surgeries also Thank you very much, sir. We will conclude the session. Great. I really appreciate uh, uh, really great talk.